gentlemen. Um, I should like to thank you uh, for having invited me uh, here today, and I must confess that I'm one of uh, that party uh, that Professor Bush called flappers and uh, deplorers, uh, because um, I've actually made a good career from flapping and deploring. Uh, but my subject here today is not uh, what I normally write about, I suppose. It's, um, it's uh, the disdain uh, of the past, though perhaps uh, hatred would be a better word for it. Uh, but let us uh, <clears throat> speak with traditional, what was once a traditional uh, British restraint, and just call it disdain. Well, since I'm a doctor by training, I'm uh, afraid that I'm going to concentrate uh, uh, on two things I'm a concrete uh, thinker. And so I shall confine myself to just a couple of instances which I hope you'll find emblematic of what I'm talking about. And there so happens there are two of my hobby horses, as my wife would tell her, unfortunately she's not here, she's heard it all before, um, she would say ad nauseam. Uh, my first example is uh, the British townscape and what has been done to it by architects and town planners. I doubt that I would uh, need very long to persuade you that the second half of the 20th century was an aesthetic disaster for the British townscape of unparalleled uh, abortions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, a few years ago, I went into an establishment in Birmingham in an area that was, uh, could be properly described as a visual hell. <laughs> it's like having your retina scoured with Brillo. <laughs> And uh, in this establishment, uh, there was on the wall an aerial photograph of that area of the city before the war. Uh, and it wasn't Rome or Paris, of course, uh, but it was a fine example of uh, Victorian and Edwardian urbanism. Well, either ignorantly or naively, I said to the receptionist while looking at it uh, rather wistfully, wasn't it a shame about the war? And she said, it wasn't the war, it was the council. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed it was. Our architects and town planners have done infinitely more damage to our cities than the Luftwaffe ever did. Correct. Yeah. The Biedecker raids were positively conservatory by comparison with what came afterwards. <laughs> the man in charge of the city planning in Birmingham who was knighted for his services to unutterable ugliness and destruction, <laughs> wanted to pull down every building in the city, and this is literally true, he wanted to build, pull down every building in the city uh, that dated from before 1950, and he got quite far. But luckily he had a fatal heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> before he uh, could complete the vandalism uh, which he had started. However, he, uh, uh, the magnificent public, Victorian public library was pulled down and replaced by a building whose hideousness would be almost comic were it not so tragic. A kind of inverted concrete ziggurat uh, that only four years later is now to be replaced by a new building of very original design, of course, uh, that manages the extremely difficult task of being even worse. <laughs> and it takes talent of a kind, I can tell you, to produce something worse than the uh, Birmingham Public Library. Now, you must not suppose that this is an isolated <coughs> example, very far from it. Perhaps the most egregious and notorious example was the plan of Bath City Council in the 1950s to modernise the city, which until then had been one of the most graceful and harmonious cities in the world, and was precisely suited to its geographical location. Well, the council preferred Le Corbusier-type architecture, and uh, thinking that it was more in keeping with the modern age, which I suppose was correct, actually. Uh, the council got as far as pulling down 4,000 Georgian houses before public protest, uh, which, of course, all true Democrats would denounce as ignorant and bigoted, uh, stopped, uh, and, and, and the most of the following well, most of the plan following destruction was halted. Although some of it has continued to this very day. 
Well, as every British town planner and corrupt town councillor knows, you can comprehensively destroy an entire town or small city with a strategically placed building. Uh, for example, Worcester was destroyed in the 1960s, once and for all, when the city council decided to pull down one part of the 18th century cathedral close and erect a concrete multi-story hotel that would have gladdened the heart of, uh, if heart is quite the right word, of Elena Ceausescu. <laughs> now, after uh, NATO stopped uh, bombing Serbia, I wrote a little article in The Spectator to say that now that we'd stopped bombing Serbia, it was time to turn the cruise missiles on Britain because there were thousands of legitimate targets. <coughs> and I thought that everyone would have a favorite uh, building to destroy. And, uh, I, and I, I didn't claim for my favorite that it was the worst, but it was my favorite, and that was the Gifford Hotel in Worcester. And the following week, the local newspaper ran a headline, uh, Spectator says, Bomb Worcester. <laughs> And I was asked to appear on the uh, local radio station with the rather hapless manager of that establishment. And he said, what you have to remember is that the hotel was built in the 1960s. And I said, yes, that's what I'm complaining about. <laughs> and he said, uh, have you ever been in it? And I said, well, I don't need to go in it. I can see that it ought to be destroyed. <laughs> And then he said something which I think encapsulates something about the new British mentality. He said, what if you came and I gave you lunch? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that we can see in that question the corruption of Messrs Blair and Cameron, which have not emerged from a complete cultural or social vacuum. If someone can propose in all seriousness on the wireless, and without any shame whatsoever, that a writer might alter his opinion about the aesthetics of a very large building <laughs> simply in exchange for a free lunch. <laughs> it is clear that there's something deeply rotten in our culture. Yeah. Now, I could continue uh, with examples for a long time. Exeter, for example, was badly damaged in the war, and it was one of the most beautiful cities in the country. And one is moved almost to tears uh, when uh, one sees what has been done and what it was before the war. But there's little doubt that much of it could have been restored. But the will to do so was not only not there, the opposite will was there. It was as if the bombing were not a catastrophe or a tragedy, uh, but a heaven-sent opportunity. Uh, the same might be said in Coventry, which until the bombing, and this might surprise some people, was one of the finest medieval towns in Europe. They're also renowned, uh, a, a very renowned centre of manufacturing, so much for the idea of British town planning as modernisation, because uh, manufacturing is not uh, the principal uh, activity of Coventry now. In fact, much of Coventry could have been restored, and the very little that was restored is of outstanding beauty, though actually it was all everyday architecture at one time. Uh, and again, one was moved almost to tears, including of rage, uh, but sometimes also of laughter. I recently uh, spent a few days in Coventry to attend as an expert witness at a murder trial and I stayed in an appropriately Soviet-style hotel uh, because I wanted the full English experience, <laughs> including the vulcanized rubber fried egg for breakfast that skates around the world on a film of ancient Greece, uh, fleeing, fleeing from the knife and thought as you chased it round the uh, and served by a waitress who looked as if she had been half-raped in some brambles on the way to work. <laughs> well, on, on the first evening, I asked the receptionist the way to a restaurant, and she said it would take seven minutes to walk there. Uh, but she didn't advise it, because the underpasses and walkways 
were not safe at that time of night, or indeed at any other time. <laughs> <laughs> but I could get a taxi instead. Though this, uh, thanks to the convoluted uh, but very modern uh, road system, would take also exactly seven minutes. <laughs> This, it seemed to me, was the apogee of British social democratic town planning. You simultaneously make the world safe for muggers and rapists while providing employment for taxi drivers. <laughs> Not long ago, I read in the Times that Cheltenham Council had decreed that planning permission would be given only to those proposed buildings that stood out from the Regency terraces of the town like a sore thumb. And I don't suppose I have to expatiate on the meaning of this uh, so-called thought. Uh, but it's not at all unusual. Someone uh, living in a 17th century house near my town in Shropshire was told that if uh, he wanted to build an extension, it must under no circumstances, under no circumstances, be in keeping with the architecture already there, even if it were an 18th century style, but must be ultra-modern and totally out of people with the building. This madness or spiritual sickness is not confined to Britain, however. In Holland, the Social Democratic Prime Minister, Hugh Denial, when working for the city of Amsterdam, seriously contemplated pulling down some of the 17th century parts of the city and replacing them with a concrete wasteland of the kind that you can see around Leiden and Utrecht uh, stations, which are so hideous they could have been built by British architects. <laughs> As we all know, Le Corbusier wanted to turn Paris into Novo Sibirsk sur Seine, and I'm uh, afraid that the forces are gathering now to try actually to do it. <clears throat> And these are forces both of politics and, I'm afraid, of corrupt economics. At the heart of this, I suggest, uh, though I can't actually prove, is an egalitarian thought. If not everyone can live in a beautiful place, then no one shall live in a beautiful place. Equality of ugliness is, after all, justice of a sort. <laughs> well, let me... Uh, let me now briefly jump uh, from one hobby horse to another. I'm a lover of old books, and insofar as my purse will allow, I buy them. Though I'm always such as I would be interested in reading, uh, uh, reading myself, and usually I write about them. It has not escaped my notice, and it doesn't <coughs> escape anybody, any purchaser of antiquarian books notice, uh, that many of these rare books uh, are discards from public institutions. Let me give you a recent small example. It's not a very important example, but it shows what I'm talking about. Uh, actually, it comes from Ireland. Again, this is a, an international problem. It comes from the uh, Royal College uh, of Surgeons in Ireland, their library. Uh, but the same is true, of course, of all our institutions. The book was on the mortality of childbed and maternity hospitals, published in 1870 by J. Matthews Duncan, a name that won't mean anything to you, but who was in his day a very important figure, and when he died, Queen Victoria said to his widow that uh, one of the most distinguished men in the country, and indeed in Europe, had died. The book is actually of great historical interest, and is very rare. And as far as I've been able to ascertain, there is not a single copy of this book for sale anywhere in the world. Uh, though, of course, uh, there might also be no other purchaser in the world than myself. <laughs> now, the librarian of the Royal College of Surgeons would be able to ask, uh, argue, and this is what they do argue, that this book had now not been consulted for a very long time and was taking up space. Actually, there, there's some justification for this argument because the book uh, was, uh, the pages were uncut. So that's it. <laughs> never <been. laughs> uh, a few, uh, he would argue, a few other uh, libraries in the world uh, would have the book, uh, but of course it wouldn't be very many. And, but because other libraries had it, it was unnecessary to keep it. And this kind of argument, 
and also the increased digitization of books, has been made the excuse uh, for librarians and institutions to disembarrass themselves of tons of old books. They're often ancient and very rare. And booksellers, I'm told, a bit like fishermen, they tell tall stories, but, they, but if one listens to booksellers, one hears very interesting stories. And I'll just give you an example or two. A bookseller told me that one day he was passing a college in a small town when he noticed a skip outside it. In it were piled 17th and 18th century books, uh, discarded from the college library, apparently to make way for uh, computer terminals. And he went into the college and spoke to the librarian, asking her not to throw these books away, but to sell them to him. And of course, immediately, she at once suspected him of being a swindler. But in the end, uh, she agreed to sell him the books. A little while later, he received a telephone call from a junior librarian of the college to tell him that, after his departure, the junior staff of the college library had been called into the chief librarian's office, and she had told him that the next time they threw away books, they should make sure that the skip was covered <laughs> so that people did not come in and make trouble. They called the, the purchaser a troublemaker. Well, there were many other stories of a similar building. The central uh, library of a large town that uh, I won't name threw away huge quantities of antiquarian books when it moved, moved, was moved from its rather grand premises, which of course were needed for bureaucrats, to new and rather less grand uh, premises. One of the librarians bought the books, the bookseller who told me this story, a first edition of Malthus. Uh, that would otherwise have been just thrown away. And he gave it to the bookseller. And it seemed to him extraordinary, as of course it would. And, and, and sadly, that the library should be throwing away such books by the time. And the official reason for it was that a municipal rule meant <coughs> that every item of council property worth more than £100, to, if it were to be sold, could be sold only with the agreement of the full town council. And since there were thousands of such items, the best thing to do was just to throw them away. Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the caliber of the people in whose hands our heritage, to say nothing of our public money, uh, uh, now lies. I could regale you with many more such stories, but of course, time does not permit. And in any case, they're fundamentally all the same story. <laughs> Suffice it to say that disdain or hatred of the past is a sickness of our time, and it has had and continues to have very baleful social effects. Thank you. I'm just wondering whether um, Anthony has. Uh,